Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium's webinar. I'm Kelly Ebersole, the Executive Director of the IWGSC, and we're joined today by Amber Hafiz, who is going to be talking about the Wheat Gene Resistance Atlas. But before we get into the webinar, I'll give you a short overview of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium. We have over 3,200 members in 71 countries. We have eight sponsors, and we work with almost 900 institutes and, and research institutes and companies. Our sponsors actually make this possible, so we want to thank Arbor Bioscience, BASF, Floramon de Pre, Inra E, Illumina, Kansas Wheat, REGT, and Syngenta for helping to make these webinars possible. Our vision, uh, what we call IWGSC 2.0, is to enhance breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular basis of traits and their allelic diversity. Our activities this year is we're working to uh, continue our efforts with Arbor Biosciences to make resources available, but we have also recently uh, been joined by Illumina to work with them on developing resources for the wheat community. Uh, recently, uh, what came online was the uh, IWGSC RefSec version 2.1 and the annotation version 2.1, and those are now freely to use without any kind of restriction uh, for the entire community, and they are available on the IWGSC uh, sequence repository at URGI. Um, we're also in the process of trying to develop and publish a clear process so that the community can contribute to manual and functional annotation. And we're continuing to find, try to find funding to sequence at high quality uh, eight land races that represent the breadth of wheat diversity and will help build a foundation for a really strong haplotype resource. We're also encouraging people to use the IWGSC and the URGI to provide pre-publication releases of genome sequences for elite wheat varieties and other resources. And as I mentioned, the IWGSC webinar series. So our next webinar will be by Stephen Benzinger, who is most recently retired from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And he has been a wheat breeder for many years and will be giving us a talk about using genomics for wheat breeding. Just a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the IWGSC YouTube channel in a few days. You can subscribe to the channel so that you never miss an upload. The presentation itself will be followed by a Q&A and you can submit your questions in the Q&A panel Please do not use the chat. Uh, you can use the chat to look at the, uh, to talk to other attendees or the organizers, but please put your questions in the Q&A panel or I, I will not see them. Uh, you can already download both of our presentations, mine as well as Amber's, in the handout section. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Amber Hafiz from the John Innes Center in the UK who will give us a webinar on how a wheat disease resistance gene atlas could lift up wheat breeding. Amber, thank you for joining us on this uh, IWGSC webinar. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, um, thanks Kelly. Um, so yes, I'm gonna to talk to you about how we could go about creating a wheat disease resistance gene atlas um, that could uh, support wheat breeding and how we could deploy this, uh, these R genes for, um, <laughs> for more durable resistance in wheat. Um, so wheat was domesticated about 10,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent. Um, and when I was in Cairo with some uh, wheat researcher colleagues, um, we were amazed to see um, these model granaries, which were found in tombs of um, very prosperous deceased people dating back to 2000 BC. Um, and these model granaries show the importance of wheat at that time. It was one of the main sources of food. And wheat is still um, the one of the most important crops worldwide. It's the most widely grown crop 
Um, and 70 to, um, 772 million tonnes of it um, are grown each year. Um, each dot here representing uh, 1 million tonnes of wheat across the continent. Um, but a study of responses from breeders by Savory and colleagues a couple of years ago um, revealed that um, about a fifth of wheat yield is estimated to be lost to pests and diseases each year. Um, the most impactful being leaf rust, two years, Fusarium head blight, septorated side blotch, and so on. And you can see some of the symptoms that these diseases cause on the right here. And given the current wheat yields, um, it can be projected that these um, that we could have an extra 209 million tons of wheat in the absence of these diseases. So one way to recapture some of this lost yield um, would be to have an arsenal of characterized disease resistance genes to target these, um, sourced from hexaploid and durum wheat as well as their progenitors. Um, so how do these R genes function in plants? Well, when um, pathogens and pests attempt to exploit hosts, they release molecules known as effectors. And these can be released inside cells or, for example, in the apoplast. Um, and effectors bind to host targets to promote infection. Um, and plants can recognize these to reduce pathogen proliferation um, and trigger immunity. So this can happen um, directly by binding with the effectors themselves or indirectly by recognizing the complexes formed when effectors bind to host targets or guardees. And this is known as the guard hypothesis. Um, our genes can belong to many different structural classes. So you can see an example here of an intracellular immune receptor or a membrane associated immune receptor. Um, they can have um, large or small effects and operate at different stages of development in plants. Um, an advantage of major effect R genes is that they um, can be more easily mapped and transferred into wheat due to their more obvious phenotypic effects. So a lot of um, great work has gone on across many different path systems in wheat, leading to the designation of uh, 467 R genes. Um, most of these um, have been identified for resistance to the rust diseases, as you can see here in powdery mildew. Um, and if we arrange these, um, by their impact on wheat yields um, based on the savory study I mentioned earlier, um, you can see that there are some gaps in our knowledge and repertoire of our genes for some of the most important diseases of wheat, such as Fusarium head blight, septorated side blotch, spot blotch, and so on. So if we could bridge some of these gaps, perhaps we could deal with these pressures a bit more effectively. In terms of the genes that have been cloned in wheat, and um, to date, uh, 47 have been cloned so far. Um, again, most of these uh, comparing resistance to the wheat rust diseases here in yellow and to padre mildew. Um, so there are still many, many of the genes that have been designated that are yet to be cloned. Um, and these R genes can also belong to many different structural classes. Um, most of the uh, cloned R genes, so 27 of the 47 that have been cloned, have been found to encode um, nucleotide binding leucine rich repeat receptors or NLRs, um, as well as a further six which have been found to encode NLRs with integrated domains. Um, but also, um, many other classes of R genes have been um, revealed, um, for example, of wool associated kinases and tandem kinases too. So um, our genes are clearly very diverse in their structure and function in wheat, and there's likely uh, much more we have to learn about these. In terms of the rate at which these genes have been cloned, um, it has been increasing exponentially over the last couple of decades. Um, and this can be um, explained by some of the new resources that have become available to researchers, such as the um, reference genome sequence, and also to advances in technology, such as in mutational genomics. Um, genes in have been cloned to using mutational genomics have been indicated here in yellow. Um, and also association genetics is um, playing more of a role, as you can see here in uh, blue. Um, but of course, map-based cloning still accounts for most of the cloned resistance genes in wheat and also provides a basis for these other newer technologies to bounce off. Um, so cloning is often driven by the publishing of these new technologies. Um, and as we clone more and more R genes in wheat, the impact of papers detailing um, newly cloned genes may start to fall. So one way we could try to keep up this cloning momentum would be through an internationally concerted effort 
focus more on the applications of these R genes to wheat breeding. Um, and as we start to approach cloning all of the genes for resistance to a particular disease, for example, we can look at things from a more systems biology perspective and answer more fundamental questions about how um, disease resistance works in wheat. So where can we look to find um, novel sources of disease resistance? Well, the diversity of um, hexaploid wheat has been influenced by several genetic bottlenecks during its speciation and domestication. This could limit our ability to find diverse R genes um, in the elite wheat gene pool. So the first of uh, these events <laughs> was the hybridization between the a gene and progenitor, um, Triticum rarity, and the B gene and progenitor, um, an extinct relative of Aegilops baltoides, to form tetraploid wheat around 0.8 million years ago. As these tetraploids started to be domesticated, um, they were cultivated and brought into contact with the D gene and progenitor, um, Aegilops talshi, and this led to some rare hybridization events resulting in the formation of hexaploid wheats. At both of these um, steps, um, only a small fraction of the genetic diversity present in these wild relatives um, was siphoned off into the hexaploid wheat gene pool. So there's a huge amount of diversity to explore here to look for um, novel resistance genes. And finally, we have the more recent effects of intensive breeding, um, where the focus is more perhaps on yields, and there may be a lot of room to look back at the uh, land race varieties of wheat, uh, tetraploid and hexaploid wheat, um, since they've been proven to have greater genetic diversity that we could explore. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 467 R genes have been designated in wheat, um, and 268 of these are native to exploit wheat, but many of them, 198, um, have originated in these wild species. So, there's been a great effort to integress um, more diversity into the wheat gene pool over the years and this is certainly an effort that I think we should aim to continue and um, especially there's probably a lot of room to explore the tertiary gene pool and um, introduce more and more diversity into wheat for um, our genes. Um, most uh, genes have been characterized um, in triticum species and many also in Aegilop species but um, there is likely a lot of room left for us to, to explore um, our genes in the Rhine thinoparum gene pools, as well as some of these other uh, genuses, because um, many of these wild grasses are a good host to wheat diseases, and there are likely to be as many genes to explore in them as in Um So the other component of this interaction is, of course, the effectors. Um, and the, the cloning of um, effectors corresponding to known R genes has been lagging behind, but there are se several um, applications of these. So effectors can be really useful as molecular diagnostics of virulence. Um, so this could help us to determine uh, the virulence is present in pathogen populations uh, um, from sequencing alone, so that some time-consuming assays could be avoided when trying to respond to these threats uh, rapidly. Um, another application is that they can be used to um, test the function of individual R genes in different wheat backgrounds or in stacks. So this can um, ensure that each gene is functioning correctly and that no stack components are being left vulnerable. Um, so far, um, eight effectors have been cloned that are recognized by cloned wheat R genes. So that includes uh, one each from the um, Stagmosporin odorum blotch causing pathogen and the septoria trichotis blotch causing pathogen, two from the uh, stem rust causing pathogen, Butinia gaminis, and four from the um, powdery mildew causing pathogen. So um, what methods can we use to clone these genes? Um, there are a few options. So um, mutational genomics and biparental mapping are traditionally used. And these rely on um, lab-generated population structures, um, as well as only allowing access to the variation present in uh, one individual in the case of mutational genomics. So potentially, if this is all of the diversity um, in a population, we could access just this green dot present in this individual, which could perhaps represent an R gene. Um, and for biopental mapping, you could have access to the variation in two um, individuals, so perhaps this pink and purple dot. 
Um, and these approaches can be quite difficult if we want to use uh, wild species um, because their poor agronomy can make uh, crossing um, and bulking seed quite difficult. So you can see the um, inaccessible looking greens of Asia that's here compared to the open spike loads of wheat. Um, and also since there is a limited genetic redundancy, since most of these, well, many of these grasses are diploids, um, this can make mutagenesis quite difficult. Um, you would need a population 10 times larger for a diploid compared to wheat. Um, there are also limitations when working with pathogens. Often they have complex life cycles and there can be difficulties with bulking mutagenizing spores on a large scale, and especially in obligate biotrophs. So another option um, is to use association mapping. And this um, method allows access to variation in the whole of the population that you're interrogating. So for example, capturing all of these colored dots here. Um, and rather than relying on a lab generated population structure, um, association mapping makes use of the historic recombination events that have structured wild populations for thousands of years. Um, so in terms of genotyping, um, one method that can be used to reduce costs um, and reduce, by reducing the complexity of the wheat genome is our gene enrichment sequencing, also known as RENseq. So in this method, probes are used to pull out all of the um, NLR class of R genes in the genome, and this enriched pool of DNA can then be sequenced. Um, however, well, many of the R genes that have been cloned have in, do encode NLRs, but of course they can also belong to many different structural classes. So if we desire an unbiased method, um, but still want to reduce the complexity of the genome, one option is chromosome flow sorting. And in this method, the chromosomes are separated out and a single chromosome of interest can then be sequenced. However, although this is um, an excellent method to combine with mutational genomics or biparental mapping, it may not be as feasible um, to use on a whole large population. Um, and with declining costs of sequencing, it's becoming more and more feasible to sequence an entire diversity panel with whole genome shotgun sequencing. This allows us to capture all the genetic variation in the panel. Um, and all of these methods aim to uh, find a correlation between um, a genotype and the traits of interest. Um, an advantage of association genetics is that one set of genotypic data uh, can be used to um, run analyses on multiple traits. So many genes can be potentially be captured using just one sequence configured panel. So if our aim is to create a large catalogue of our genes for breeding and to do this rapidly, um, association genetics may be the most efficient approach. One example of this is um, a recent uh, study from the Open Wild Wheat Consortium led by Kim Gurav. Um, in which a whole genome shotgun sequenced Agelops Tashai diversity panel um, was used to identify candidate genes underlying several traits by association genetics. And they identified um, a diverse range of candidate genes, so an alpha beta hydrolase underlying trichum number, for example, and a wheat tandem kinase underlying paradry mildew resistance, and an NLI for resistance to wheat curl mite. So, this is a really good example of how whole genome shotgun GWAS can be employed by a worldwide consortium um, to claim many interesting target genes. Um, so sequencing diversity panels, although um, the costs of dropping costs of sequencing make it more feasible, it's still not a small task. Um, it's important to try to capture the maximum amount of genetic diversity while limiting computational and sequencing costs. So a good first step is to quality check the panel. Um, it's important to remove duplicate accessions. Um, <laughs> Um, as these can lead to inflated um, linkage disequilibrium, which can cause uh, pos uh, false positive associations when employing GWAS. Um, so it's important for us to uh, mitigate this by removing duplicate accessions. Um, this can be done by performing some cost-effective genotyping, such as genotyping by sequencing, um, to remove duplicate accessions and perform some population analyses. So it's important to identify the major ancestral groups um, and as well as determining the phylogenetic distribution of all of the accessions in the panel. 
Um, a gold standard diversity panel would contain accessions that are homozygous, non-redundant, and selected to maximize um, the genetic and geographic diversity of the species, so accessing most of the species' uh, natural range. Um, these are some examples from an Ajax Tarshai diversity panel that was used to clone uh, forest and moss resistance genes. So once um, this quality checking step has been completed, we can generate assemblies in four tiers. Um, so diamond, gold, silver, and bronze. Um, ideally, diamond level assemblies um, should be generated for um, each major ancestral group. So this would be nine in wheat. Um, these assemblies provide chromosome level pseudomolecules and um, giving the position of all genes in their physical context. Um, and this would allow the anchoring of the more fragmented assemblies um, further down in our pyramid. Um, so this would hopefully capture all major structural variants and be a bit more effective than using a single reference. Um, so at the gold level, uh, sequencing could be performed for each of the um, major clades identified in the population. Um, and this could allow definition of all the haplotypes in the genome haplotype box in the genome um, with N50 values, preferably in the megabyte range. So this would be important to allow interrogation of all of the genes within an LD block of a region associated with a trait. Um, silver level assemblies could be generated for uh, tens of accessions in the panel, depending on uh, the panel. Um, and this would be to obtain a gene level resolution, including regulatory elements, um, so this could be used to design and engineer gene constructs for functional validation of candidate genes. Combined with the platinum and gold level assemblies, this would capture the pan-gene and pan-gene regulatory space um, in the panel. And the remaining accessions can be sequenced to bronze level with low coverage alumina reads to capture the SNP-wide variation in the panel. So additional features could also be added to this, such as the epigenetic status of uh, gold level accessions um, with methylated sites indicated here by these blue lollipops. Um, and also RNA seq data could be generated for all the accessions at bronze level. And this would give some insight into the regulation of gene expression that can help to narrow down candidate genes. Um, so of course, for such a large undertaking, it's important to think about how we could fund it. Um, and to produce an atlas at a large scale, um, we could ideally sequence 10 host and 9 pathogen diversity panels, each at about 200 accessions per panel. So this would likely include uh, lamb rice, winter and spring varieties of bread wheat, um, lamb rice and elite varieties of durum wheat, the progenity species, as well as a couple of wild species like um, Dinopyrum and rye. In terms of diseases, um, some of the diseases that uh, could be included would be serum headline blast, the rest diseases, powdery mildew, and uh, blotch diseases such as septoria, um, sphagnosporinodorum, and tan spot. And so altogether, to sequence these panels, um, at, we're using the tiered system that I just described, um, it would cost about 7.6 million. So that would be around 6 million for the host panels um, and about 1.5 million for the pathogen panels. Um, and of course, there's also the cost of employing people to perform the pathogen assays, the bulking um, and the transformation, as well as the bioinformatics. Oh, sorry. Um, um, and this would work out at about 75 full-time equivalents over the course of five years. So 375 full-time equivalents in total. Um, and a useful comparison to make here is to the Sainsbury Lab in Norwich. So um, over the last two years, staffing at the Sainsbury Lab has averaged at um, 75 full-time equivalents per year, um, which is what we would require for our Atlas project. So according to Companies House, the cost of um, running TSL for five years would be uh, $50 million. So we can infer that this real world budget could also cover the molecular biology and employment costs of the Atlas project as well. Um, and this would work out at about $2.9 million um, dollars per year over five years from HD20 country. Um, so with some coordination to make this fund stretch as far as possible, um, we could hope to clone perhaps 100 R genes through this model. 
Um, and given the 209 million tonnes of losses from pests and diseases each year, there's likely to be a very good return on any investment made to mitigate these disease losses. So even by reducing um, pathogen losses by just 1%, it would result in a 31-fold return on investment for every um, dollar spent on the Argene Atlas. So researchers and breeders are constantly going to these immense efforts to um, characterize and deploy new resistance genes into wheat. Um, but unfortunately, this investment can be lost in just a few years um, if genes are released in a way that may provide some short-term gains in yield, but ultimately facilitates the evolution of pathogen virulence. For example, in Europe, many of the big wheat, winter wheat varieties only have a life of three to five years. Once these um, R genes are broken, um, breeding focuses on new targets and this cycle continues. So what could we do to break this boom and bust cycle and make the most of our investment in the R gene atlas? Um, so we can try to put our information that we've gathered about cloned R genes and cloned effectors together um, in a useful way to try and engineer uh, deploy um, these resistance genes more durably. So information on uh, current and local pathogen diversity um, can be used um, and since we will have, uh, we hope to have a pool of cloned effectors, it will be easy to determine from um, sequences of these pathogens which um, effectors they contain. From here we can then, uh, we could then design an R gene stack which targets as many of these effectors as possible with the least number of R genes. In this example, um, I think each of these pathogen strains is targeted by at least two of these R genes. Um, and more ideally, you would also want uh, broad spectrum resistance genes um, that provide resistance to many of these effectors, or that recognize many of these effectors. Um, once a stack has been designed, um, it then obviously needs to be transferred into wheat. So this could be done through traditional means like crossing and Marcus's selection. Um, or through transformation. Um, crossing in Marxist selection is fine when there's just a couple of genes or one gene, but when multiple genes are being integrated from uh, wild sources, um, this can introduce many deleterious alleles, potentially, um, also known as linkage drag. Um, and this, also a large number of crosses would be required, um, which may become difficult to manage. If we were to address four genes for resistance to three different diseases um, into wheat, this would be about 12 genes, and the crossing scheme may look something like this. Um, so this has been um, designed to try to maintain the maximum amount of the um, recurrent parent or the elite background, so to around 98%, whilst integrating these 12 genes from various sources. Um, so this would take about 20 generations in speed breeding conditions where um, an extended daylight period is used to reduce the generation time of wheat to about eight weeks. Um, this could take about four years, which does seem, doesn't seem that long um, to gain a cultivar which um, has 12 resistance genes for resistance to three diseases and to get into it. However, this cultivar will inevitably fall behind in yield and perhaps other traits will become important. So this process of crossing all of these genes in would have to continue. Um, so another option um, would be to introduce all the genes at a single locus or a couple of loci um, using a transgenic cassette. Um, and this would avoid the genes from being genetically separated. So breeding could then focus more on maintaining background resistance and on other traits um, without having to worry that this stack would become broken up or lost. So um, once genes have been introduced, they need to be deployed into the field. Um, typically, we tend to uh, grow crops in monocultures. Um, and if there's just a single R gene present in a monoculture situation, this is ideal for pathogens as they can very easily um, develop a mutation that allows virulence on this monoculture and then this could cause an epidemic. Um, another option would be to deploy um, several R genes um, in, within a field. So this would be um, multi, so multi lines um, would have the same background and only differ in their um, R gene complement. 
So this reduces the selection pressure on any particular R gene. Um, and another option is a stacking, as I mentioned, where all of these genes are present in a single uh, plant. And this even more greatly reduces the chance that um, there will be any pathogen reproduction on these plants. Um, it's also, we can also consider um, reducing the um, uh, exposure of these uh, R genes from year to year or season to season by rotating the R genes present in the fields um, continuously. Um, so this could be done with monocultures, but even more ideally, this could be done with multi-lines or stacks so that um, any gain of virulence that the pathogen achieves in one growing season will become useless or perhaps even confer a fitness disadvantage in the next growing season when those agents are no longer present. So this could really help to um, increase the uh, durability of stacks. So even if we have a really coherent and deployment strategy, um, how genes are deployed in one field uh, is not enough to protect them from being squandered. We need to consider their deployment in a wider, in a wider landscape um, and the virulence frequencies in the wider pattern population. So, but how can we actually control the release of these genes or genes cloned in the Atlas project, for example? We have an ongoing discussion with many breeders from around the world on this topic. Um, we would like to thank for all their insight, um, especially uh, Robert Bowden, who's a co-author in our review and provided um, the ideas on the following slides. So, our gene, manage our gene stewardship can be defined as the careful and responsible management of our genes so that they remain effective for prolonged use. And our genes can be split into three groups depending on their need for stewardship. So, group A genes, um, are thought to be inherently durable and not require stewardship. So this, these are genes which, for example, have been proven to be durable in the field over many decades, such as LA34, LA46 and SR2. Um, genes which confer non-race specific immunity but have been more recently cloned, such as LR67, YR36. Similarly, um, non-race specific immunity from recessive genes like MLO could be inherently durable. Um, and also another class of genes which um, may not require stewardship or widely defeated genes since these it's it's uh, too late to promote stewardship of these genes. Um, so group B uh, is for genes which are still um, not broken down or only broken down in very rare situations. Um, so these are vulnerable to defeat but still very useful genes in the field. Um, and this includes genes like YR5, YR15, SR22, and SR26. Um, these would ideally only be deployed in stacks so that several mutations uh, could be withstood in the pathogen population while still preventing pathogen reproduction on plants containing a stack with these genes. Um, and we could incentivize um, breeding for, gene, for um, multi gene resistance to protect genes like these. Um, by trying to integrate with existing cultivar release programs and, for example, awarding extra points to cultivars which um, have multi-gene resistance, as this could um, make their release more likely over cultivars which do not have multi-gene resistance. But of course, this would be something that um, couldn't be enforced. It would have to be um, a voluntary scheme where we try to promote um, the breeding of cultivars with um, stacks, our gene stacks. Um, and importantly, the atlas um, can be used to design perfect markers for these genes if we manage to claim more of them. And this will help to assess the origin complement of existing varieties so that breeders know um, how much diversity of our genes is in their varieties. Um, group C would be for um, our genes which have likely never been presented to wheat pathogen populations. So this includes um, those cloned from uh, for example, diversity panels of wild relatives, um, which have just been introduced into wheat or, or transformed into wheat, um, and also newly developed synthetic R genes. So the best way to protect these um, could be through a more um, intensive management scheme, and they could perhaps be patented to try to um, limit the um, deployment of them so that they are not uh, squandered. 
And again, they would ideally be deployed in um, Ardeen stacks. Um, so far, um, ten, there are eight active patents on our genes and wheat um, indicated here in dark blue. Um, seven of these have been patented by the um, CSIRO and or two blades. Um, and we may see more patents come out associated with uh, more newly claimed genes as they are um, kept confidential for two years. So in conclusion, um, Sequencing diversity panels can be thought of as generating libraries of R genes that we could browse to look for the most effective um, R gene combinations to deal with particular pathogen threats. And we could use this library continuously and add to it to achieve the R gene machine. So this would be a situation where bioinformatics pipelines can allow us to move very quickly from a phenotype to a full length candidate gene. We could then synthesize these genes um, and test their function with cloned effectors. We can then deploy them in appropriate stacks and again ensure that these genes are remaining effective um, through the use of purified effectors. So if we can come together to um, put together a project like this, um, perhaps one day we could turn wheat into a non-host for its major pathogens. Um, so yeah, um, I'd like to thank um, my co-authors on the review that we've written on this topic. Um, my supervisor Branda and my colleague Shreya Sanu and David at the John Inner Centre and also Robert Bowden, our co-author and based at the USDA. Um, I'd like to thank our funding, so the BBSRC and the Doctoral Training Partnership at the Narch Research Park, the Two Blades Foundation and also um, several people who helped us with this project, so Tobin for designing the figures, Mark Lutzbacher for advising us with our um, RG Atlas budget, uh, Michael van Sagen for help with taxonomic classifications of wild relatives of wheat and Simon Aspen for helping with patent searches. Um, and yeah, thank you for listening. Um, and if you would like to know more, uh, feel free to contact me or you can also read our preprint, which is a fun to know do. Thank you very much, Amber, for a great webinar. So we are now open for for questions, um, so feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel um, at this point. So I'm going to start. Uh, stewardship is a critical, as you mentioned, is really critical to um, uh, for these R genes. Um, do, other than a voluntary system, do you see and patents? Uh, do you see any way that the community could come together to actually, you know, both industry and public sector breeders could actually come together and try to deploy these more strategically? Um, yeah, so I think it would be difficult to organize because I think different countries have different um, approaches to release programs, um, etc. Um, I think Patenting is quite a good method because you can then, at least in the regions where you've um, released that patent, you can um, somewhat control um, yeah, how and where these genes are deployed. Um, so you could ensure, for example, that newly cloned genes are only deployed in stacks, so that they're much less likely to be broken down. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it would be great if we could put a body together to um, more judiciously manage our genes, but I think it would be um yeah quite <laughs> quite <Challenge>. big <laughs> taking yes i can imagine it would be a challenging effort but might well be be a useful one for someone to actually pursue so one of the other aspects that you talked about was the rapid increase in gene cloning since the release of the reference sequence we've seen that in a number of other crops as the reference sequence became available, there was a, a rapid increase in gene cloning. Um, what do you see now as perhaps a bottleneck for additional gene cloning technologies, or what do you see as a, as a possibility that could really accelerate that even further than where we are today? Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, um, yeah, in the past, obviously, new technologies, new resources, they've boosted the rate of 
um, gene cloning. And yeah, perhaps maybe we have reached a bottleneck, somewhat of a bottleneck with that. There are definitely more to explore, but um, yeah, it may be that the kind of motivation for gene cloning may shift from being um, for the purpose of generating high impact papers and talking about new technologies. It may that be that most gene cloning actually happens because of um, funding through projects such as, for example, a big wheat gene, R gene atlas project where the focus is specifically to increase the number of cloned R genes. Um, because, yeah, perhaps we will reach a point where there is a bottleneck in um, the impact of R genes published um, alongside, yeah, as you say, these new technologies. So while your focus has been on resistance genes, and of course the Gene Atlas is focused on resistance genes, is there a, a need for a very broad gene cloning atlas? I mean, to go beyond resistance genes? I mean, do you see that as a potential opportunity? I mean, I didn't look at the, and haven't really measured the genes that have been cloned uh, since the reference sequence, for example, but we know they're not merely resistance genes. So mm -hmm. is you know, a percentage, I mean, are they like 10% of the genes that have been cloned? And would it make sense to try to build something even more broadly applicable than just the resistance atlas? Yeah, I mean, I think the really great thing about uh, using association genetics, for example, and sequence diversity panels is there's no reason why you can't explore all kinds of other traits. I mean, as I showed with the example from the Open Wild Wheat Genome consor Sequencing Consortium, um, they um, also looked at a trico number, for example. Um, so, you know, with a sequence diversity panel, I mean, you're capturing all of the diversity, hopefully, the genetic diversity present in that species. So you could screen that for any trait of interest. Um, yeah, so it's definitely much more broadly applicable. Right. All right, so we do have quite a few questions that are now coming in. Let me try to get to them. We have the... oh, sorry, I'm running into a problem with the panel on the on the screen. All right, so let's go with the first one. Do you have any um, any suggestions on how they would how one should approach the challenge of low wheat production in Africa through wheat breeding? Or so, what are there particular opportunities that you see there? Um, or gene cloning, for example. What was that? Sorry. So what of what you talked about today, do you see some opportunities for in for increasing wheat production in places that are hot weather or drought? Mm -hmm. um, well, as as I as yeah, as I said in response to your previous question, um, you could certainly screen these. So if yeah, diversity panels were sequenced as part of this specific project or any project, um, they could also be screened for traits like drought tolerance, salinity tolerance, etc., and to try to yeah, identify um, genes determining these traits as well. So yeah, I think it could be uh, used to solve um, these problems also. All right. Um, so one of the other questions relates to the cost of patenting. There is a lot of cost to actually patent a gene. Are there other opportunities than patenting? Well, um, ideally, I mean, kind of like what you said earlier, it would be really great if we could um, put um, an organization or consortium together to uh, really, for everyone to, yeah, agree on, um, gene stewardship um, practices um, without the need for patenting. Um, but yeah, I think it would it's quite difficult because I, I don't think it would be something that would be that you could legally enforce. Um, right. But yes, in an ideal world, <laughs> if we could um, put together um, more checks and balances 
and integrate those with cultivar release programs that would be that would likely help all right so one of the next questions is the necrotrophic pathogens that cause diseases such as tan spot and nodorum blotch rely on susceptibility genes such as tsn1 that must be removed or inactivated to obtain resistance how do these fit within a gene stewardship group hmm. um. Any idea? Um, I'm not really sure. Yeah, the stewards. Um, well, I suppose the same. Yeah, I'm not sure. So. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so one of the other questions are, uh, do you know, if, or did you state correctly that these R genes are downstream of PT1? and ET1, and is it possible to use this approach in parasite plants? In yeah. parasite plants? Yeah. I assume perhaps in other, other plants. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know much personally about, yeah, para parasitic plants, but... Um, I'm sure, yeah, you, this kind of approach would be useful in um, any population yeah. of plants. Or perhaps any any plant species, in fact. Yeah, yeah, any diverse plant species. Yeah. What are the chances of breaking down resistance gene cassettes by new virulent rust race? So yeah, I think it, it depends on um, how, so it depends on whether the components of the stack have been exposed to, you know, pathogen populations on their own previously, um, how much virulence is present, you know, in the population already. I mean, say you had um, a stack which contained only genes which um, had, for which there was no pre-existing virulence in the pathogen population. Um, you could expect that stack to with, last a very long time. Um, so yeah, but if you have a stack where a couple of the components where there's already you know, virulence present in the pathogen population, um, it would be easier for them to then break the stack. So it really yeah depends, which is one reason to look at um, exotic species and wild relatives, um, because hopefully some of these genes are less likely to have been exposed to you know, wheat patch and populations before. All right. So what about not cloning these genes uh, and just instead just doing fine mapping? Would that be easier? And yes, we assume it probably would be. Um, and but what the real question is, would it still deliver most of the impact that is sought? Um, so, yeah, I mean, like I, I showed um, with um, you know, this, the crossing scheme that I put up, um, it, it can be, if you want to ingress, you know, our gene stacks for several different diseases into a single variety, um, it could be quite challenging to do that with um, marcus-assisted selection or to continue to do that. Um, so it, if we clone these genes, it gives us the option of um, generating our gene cassettes, which could be transformed in. Um, but also, um, you know, by cloning the genes, we can look into their function and answer more biological questions about them um, and also design more perfect markers uh, for their tracking. So I think there's a lot of um, advantages to cloning the genes. Um, and as well, as we said earlier, um, if we're using an approach where we're sequencing whole diversity panels, I mean, the applications aren't just there for um, disease resistance genes, you could look at many different targets. Right. So there are a number of genes that have been identified, um, but many have not been cloned yet. Are there efforts underway there at John Innes and some of the other perhaps projects of which you're aware where they are doing gene cloning? Yeah, so there are lots of 
yeah, projects looking at disease resistance here at John Innes. Um, my own work is looking at um, trying to clone uh, disease resistance genes for resistance to um, septoria tritici blot. So yeah, there's a lot of work going on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Could be interesting to compile just to see what everyone is doing to the extent that it's possible. But, so another question is, um, are there sufficient wheat genetic resources uh, that are available and accessible uh, for you to actually put together a resistance gene atlas and what what are the gaps in those collections that you perceive? Um, so there are a lot of um, resources currently available. There's a lot there for um, Ajax Tasha as I mentioned. Um, there's yeah there's the Watkins and Race collection for which there are lots of resources available. Um, and also there's, of course, the wheat um, pan genome, um, where there's, yeah, many wheat genome sequences of very high quality. Um, so I think, you know, we already have a lot of these resources. Um, it's, it would be great to add to them to generate diversity panels of more and more um, wild relatives. Um, but yeah, there is already a lot to build on. Yeah. So you wouldn't see a need for building up additional resources other than what may be happening independently in individual projects, perhaps? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as I mentioned, with there's a lot of reasons for um, having, um, for, like I said, many um, diamond level or platinum level assemblies for, you know, the major ancestral groups in a diversity panel and things like that, which can really help to um, anchor the more fragmented um, sequencing that you would do in an entire diversity panel. And those kind of things, those kind of uh, details, they may need to be addressed in some existing panels. So we may want to add to existing panels, but um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So are viral diseases within the scope of the resistance gene atlas? Um, yeah, I mean, viral diseases aren't my area of expertise, but I'm sure, um, yeah, you could employ similar methods to other, the rest of the diseases by performing pathogen assays on the diversity panels uh, with these. But yeah, it's not really my, <laughs> I don't know much about viral diseases, if I'm honest. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in some cases, resistance genes don't confer their effect. For example, YR15 confers resistance to all yellow races worldwide, but it was present in, in certain susceptible wheat cultivars. So are there other susceptible alleles? Um, yeah, so many our genes have um, yeah, susceptible alleles also associated with them. Um, LR34 is an example. Um, that, yeah, there are several genes where you could have a single mutation between, you know, a resistant cultivar and a susceptible cultivar. Um, so yeah, I think that's a broad phenomenon. All right. So. Um, what would be the role of the ABR gene cloning in this project? And why do you think ABR cloning has been lagging behind? Um, well, I'm not sure. It may be that the collections are um, difficult to, yeah, as I said, difficult to bulk up. It could be difficult to um, perform you know, large assays on diversity panels. It requires, you know, specialized labs to do that pathology work. Um, so, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly why it's been lagging behind. <laughs> okay, so what is the role of allelic diversity in resistance genes? Um, yeah, it's, it's, Important, a lot of allelic um, R genes have been cloned for resistance to uh, powdery mildew, for example. Um, and there could be opportunities where alleles are very, very similar um, to um, 
use gene editing to alter the alleles present in cultivars. Um, so yeah, I think cloning the alleles of ex ex resistant genes is important. So another question is, uh, what diseases should be the beginning focus? I mean, have you thought at all about prioritizing particular diseases and, or is it without priority? Well, um, I think a good one to target is uh, diseases like stem rust, which are still causing um, major epidemics are quite important. Um, and then of course there's, as I showed, diseases which have, you know, a very high impact on global wheat yields, so diseases like septoria, fusarium head blight, and so on. Um, but yeah, I suppose, you know, if um, those who, yeah, if someone came forward wanting to put money together to um, kickstart the iGene Atlas, you know, it, might, it may depend which um, organizations or scientists come forward right. to do that. <laughs> Right. So have, have you had any involvement with the UG99 effort? Um, I personally haven't. <laughs> Just curious if that's been one that, you know, could be a potential. I mean, maybe there's a potential for funding support in mm -hmm. that regard and starting with, with efforts. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be yeah. promising. Yeah. All right, so uh, you're in the process of completing your your PhD. So let me ask you about a career question. What is your what is your long term goal? Oh, um, yeah, I'd really like to stay in wheat research. Um, for the next few years, I hope to yeah keep working um, on my current project uh, to finish that up, and I'd yeah eventually hope to perhaps have a faculty position at university um, or something like that. <laughs> so we, we would like for you to stay in wheat research. It's really important for us to continually have a strong pipeline of scientists in, in wheat. And what drew you to wheat? Um, well, yeah, I guess when I was looking at project proposals and things from a PhD, um, I think I was just trying to look for something that jumped out at me as having potential real world applications. Um, and obviously, as I said in the beginning, wheat has enormous importance. It's the most widely grown crop in the world. So I thought, yeah, what better <laughs> crop to work on? <laughs> That's what a lot of us think too, you know, is to, to try to have an impact in that arena. So you mm -hmm. come in <clears throat> to your career, <clears throat> excuse me, at a time where it's almost post reference sequence. So for, for many of us, you know, we've been spending years trying to develop the genomic resources. How critical do you think these genomic resources are for, for your career and what you may see uh, as your career in the future? I mean, I think it's quite amazing. Um, like I've watched in the space of, you know, my PhD, um, so many uh, great gene cloning papers come out of my lab um, in such a short time, which is very exciting to yeah, see the pace of um, this area of research at the moment. Um, and yeah, I guess it's exciting to see all those possibilities there. And yeah, just I think it's a great time to get started just when all of these things are in place um, and so many resources are, are available, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a good time to be in wheat research, which is was one of the goals, at least from the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium standpoint, uh, was to increase the number of people working on wheat and to do that by providing genomic resources so you can do really interesting science. So we hope you do stay in, in wheat. And I want to thank you again, Amber, for a great webinar. And thank everyone for participating. And we hope that you'll join us again uh, within the next few weeks for our next webinar. And with this, we'll close. So thank you very much. Have a great day.